Hello everyone. Welcome back to the final part of this training on drought monitoring, prediction and projection using NASA Earth System data. This is part 4 and today we will focus on the regional drought monitoring tools. Our RSET instructor today is Dr. Erika Bordest. She is from NASA JPL and we have guest speakers Dr. Amber Jean McCollum from NASA Ames and Dr. Rita Majumdar from North Carolina State University. In part one, we had an overview of drought monitoring data and tools using Earth observations. In part two, we focused on drought prediction using NASA subseasonal to seasonal predictions. And in last session, part three, we focused on climate change projections and droughts. Today, our focus is going to be on demonstration of regional drought monitoring tools. Overall objectives for today are identify regional drought projects with NASA's Western Water Applications Office or WAO, explore how the WAO developed Navajo Nation Drought Severity Evaluation Tool or DSAT is used to calculate drought matrix and vegetation health anomalies. And finally, we will explore Sustainable Forest Management and Information System or SFMIS using Jupyter Notebook to assess impact of drought on forest cover change. Just as in previous sessions, please put your questions in the questions box and we will address them at the end of the webinar. Please feel free to enter your questions as we go. We will try to get to all the questions during the Q&A session after the webinar and the remainder of the questions will be answered in the question and answer document which will be posted to the training website about a week after the training. As I mentioned earlier, our, our, our set speaker is Dr. Erika Bordes. Our first speaker, Dr. Amber Jean McCollum, is a researcher and capacity building specialist in the Earth Science Division at NASA Ames Research Center. Her work in Earth Action focuses on project management, community engagement, and creating remote sensing trainings for land and water applications. She is the program manager for NASA's Indigenous Peoples Initiative within the Community Action Element. And she is the Impact and Transition Lead for NASA's Western Water Applications Office. Our second guest speaker is Dr. Rita Majumdar. He is a postdoctoral fellow at North Carolina State University, working on several problems pertaining to the statistical modeling of extreme weather and climate change. Ritham was a member of 2021-22 Future of Fire cohort of the USGS Climate Adaptation Postdoctoral Fellows. He has a PhD in statistics from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, and specializes in special statistics, Bayesian in inference, and probabilistic machine learning. With that, I invite Amber to talk about WAO and DSET. Thank you, Amina, um, and thank you all at RSET for having me today. Um, as a previous RSET instructor, it's really great to be back with you all. Um, so my name is Amber McCullum, and I am the Western Water Applications Office Impact and Transition Lead. And today I'll be providing you with an overview of NASA's Western Water Applications Office, or as we like to call it, WAO. And I'll be speaking about a few of our drought projects and highlights, and then pro providing you with a demonstration of one of our tools that were developed through our program. WAO is part of NASA's Water Resources Program area, which supports the use of Earth observations in water resource management related to water demand, supply, and quality via innovative solutions with partners and stakeholders. WAO has a long-standing partnerships on many projects around snowpack, event transpiration, land subsidence, and many more. We were established in 2016 under NASA's Applied Sciences Program to really build on these relationships and these successes. And as you may know, the Western United States faces unique challenges when it comes to water, including diminishing snowpack, timing and amount of runoff, increasing frequency of droughts and floods, falling groundwater levels, 
increased uncertainty around future water supplies. And the demand is really growing for using NASA Earth observations to provide important information to address some of these issues. Thus, the Western Water Applications Office was developed to increase partner interactions and partner driven projects around water resources west of the 100th meridian in the United States. Here, we work closely with water managers to get the data, tools, and products into the hands of water managers. And we consistently work with stakeholders to identify what their needs are. And this is really important before launching into a project to ensure that we're doing useful work. The whale program process is a little bit different than maybe your typical earth action program. Here we focus on the entire life cycle of a project and the water management needs and applications. First, we identify needs through in-person river basin needs assessment activities where we create use cases giving our partner needs and where the earth observations can be used to suit those needs. So we have conversations, we hold workshops, prior to the development of the projects. Then we create a request for information for partner-driven projects to address those specific basin needs. Finally, we work with the project teams on transition of the data, tools, and products to the partner agency for long-term sustained use. And this can be a challenge, but it's ultimately where we see a lot of our success. So given these, fo these focus areas of our program, these are the types of work we have done. So we've conducted four needs assessments um, in, in seven Western basin basins and watersheds studied. We have over 60 use cases documented and have had, have had over 150 participants at these conversational workshops. To connect with the scientific and user community, we've had over 15 projects with nearly 40 partners and over 20 papers and articles um, and long-standing connections with private uh, sector partners. To ensure the sustained use of our tools, we have transitioned six capabilities. We help bolster the creation of a new company. We've held research to operations workshops and have had two research to operations publications and multiple impact assessments. As mentioned, the first step in assessing the, the needs is our river basin needs assessments. Um, this is the process of identifying and mapping water resource gaps as they relate to the unique needs of particular river basins. So these initial gaps are the basis for the breakout groups and our in-person assessment workshops. And there we bring together um, groups of people who are working in water decision making. Um, where we have a multi-day event. And we've conducted these uh, workshops in multiple uh, river basins across the, the US. You can see um, many of those mapped out here. And after the needs assessments are completed, we create reports and we hope to support and fund projects um, that specifically address all of those needs that we've talked about, or at least some of those needs we've talked about in these needs assessment workshop. We also work towards the successful application transition or what some may call research to operations. And so this is really about the long-term sustained use of the products and tools that we create. And this transition planning occurs through all phases of the project and it starts in the concept phase and throughout the design and formulation and implementation of the, of the project. And so this really involves um, including the partner and stakeholder throughout this entire decision process to ensure that they're going to really use um, these products and tools in the future. So our whale projects focus on a wide array of water resource topic areas and applications. And I've just mentioned a few here. So a better understanding of snowpack is a really important piece of, of the work in the Western US. Um, so we've contributed to things like um, the creation of the Airborne Snow Observatory, um, as well as um, things like um, river forecasts for um, the Colorado River Forecast Center. 
Um, we've also um, helped develop um, prediction and assessment of snow conditions through near real time snowpack estimation with the California Department of Water Resources. In the areas of evapotranspiration and agricultural water, WEO's operational evapotranspiration visualizer enables New Mexico's state engineer office to make more informed decisions on water rights transfer transfers. And WEO has conducted inter comparison studies of different evapotranspiration models with the Bureau of Reclamation. Um, it's also been a large supporter of the Open ET platform, um, which some of you may be familiar with, um, as well as things like um, our ET tool for irrigated lands and the Crop Chasma Soil Moisture app, as well as Crop Manage, which improves irrigation management. Um, and as this uh, training is really focused on drought, I'll highlight two of our um, drought focused projects that we've had in the subsequent slides. So that's sort of an overview of the WAO program. If you'd like to hear more about our program, please connect with us. Um, we have our WAO website listed here. We also have our WAO water portal, which um, highlights some of these projects and tools. It also um, aims to be a, an interactive place for users and decision makers and scientists to come um, and look at what's out there um, in the world of um, water and remote sensing and earth observations. I've also included our program manager, Stephanie Granger, and her email here. So now I'd like to give a few um, brief examples of drought projects. The first project comes from the Colorado River Basin, and this is the Western Land Data Assimilation, or Western LDAS Drought Monitoring in Colorado. This project was led by a team of researchers at the University of Maryland and NASA Goddard in partnership with the Colorado Climate Center. And so you can see the project team listed here. The goal of this project was to support the decision makers with the data on water availability by partnering with the Colorado Climate Center and other state and local agencies to assist with drought assessment, groundwater and agricultural management needs. This project applies NASA's land information system or LIS software to integrate data from multiple sources. Um, so this includes things like GRACE data, MODIS, NLDAS2, PRISM, STATSGO, FAO, and SRTM. And this pulls it all together in a configuration that's really optimized for the Western US. And the Colorado Climate Center provides weekly updates to the United States Drought Monitor using um, some of this information. And the current land surface model uh, products do not reflect some of the complex topography in the region. And it really requires higher resolution soil moisture data, evaporative demand, evapotranspiration, snowpack, and irrigation estimates. So land surface models provide either estimates of water and energy budget budgets that are continuous in space and time and physically consistent. The beauty of LIS is that it combines satellite data and in-situ observations of the water cycle with our understanding of the physical processes in the model via data assimilation. So this project uses the GRACE follow-on satellites to measure the inner satellite distance, which are derived using spatial maps of Earth's gravity fields through geophysical inversion. The temporal variability of gravity is then used to infer terrestrial water storage changes, which include soil moisture, groundwater, snow, and surface water. These GRACE total water storage anomalies um, are monthly and are available over large spatial scales with two to four months of data latency. And the GRACE data assimilation into the land surface model is one way to overcome some of the, the limitations of the GRACE data. As part of the Western LDAS project, GRACE was assimilated into the NOAA MP model at a one kilometer spatial resolution for spatial and temporal downscaling. Model simulation was driven by the NLDAS2 forcing data, which were downscaled to one kilometer using the, the list built-in functions. So here we have monthly total water storage anomalies relative to the seasonal mean from three sources. One, open loop means no grace input. We can see the effect of spatial downscaling and filling missing data by the grace data assimilation. 
Here we have percentile maps for three variables for September 21st, 2021. Percentiles were derived by comparing soil moisture and groundwater storage estimates from GRACE with climatology derived from about 20 years of GRACE data. The lower percentiles, the the lower the percentile, the drier the conditions. Percentiles can be converted to the US drought monitor categories using these specific thresholds. So D4 for exceptional drought, um, D3 for extreme, D2 for severe, D1 for moderate, and D0 for anom um, abnormally dry. So the NOAA MP simulated groundwater storage represents water storage changes in shallow unconfined aquifers that interact with the atmosphere, not groundwater levels in specific aquifers. And groundwater may show a lagged response in precipitation and ET compared to soil moisture, and thus groundwater drought maps often indicate persistent drought conditions. In this case, um, the Colorado River Basin has been in a drought for several years, and these kinds of maps are made available via the Colorado Climate Center. So in case you're interested, there are two sets of near real time grace based drought indicators available for CONUS and the global domain. They are produced by the hydrological sciences laboratory at Goddard and the CONUS indicators have a 0.125 degree resolution and are driven by the NLDAS 2 forcing data while the global indicators have a 0.25 degree resolution and they are um, driven by the ECMWF forcing data. And some of the references can be found here at this, at this link provided. And so you can find these maps and find some of these data outputs from this project via um, the links shared here. The next project is dear, near and dear to me as I was the project lead for this project before I was a member of the WAO program office. And I wanna start this out with a beautiful introductory video. Ecuador, Trochido, Ado and Dita, Trolla hate ego eya, not laws, Adiki eya. Ah, ah, da hat eh. Nald losh betro. Villa ash lai betro. Ended the lay natin say betro. Ah, ah, ego eya, con diki eya, but a wana ah. Nleda tro. Besto banana ahata. Jo eat that eya et one dat los. In the delay, ya conti, ki a ya. Tornat laws a key, ki a ya, a flesh behal cardiki, the chit down. I don't end the day, quiggy, a da hold bell. Dark catching eat loss. A do doubt a ya. Hans, so got a ya deeder, not losh, but all let wind single. A digi a ya, a quiggy hans, so got she a ya. That then stlen da ajil in lenko. A konde do ye gona haltieno. De de tronat lozen abitje na huntla. Kondan da de yol. Klej da eya konde da trago da naz trandle. Ado in de da beshil wadegi, troil wadegi. Beshna Batliki da adat e. A con da e ya e troha. O ndal sa do han sogoshe e troha. Ya atend a. E digi e ya e con trohagi. Jo hut ego alto. A jigo alto hut ego e ya. A hilt ego e bena hot ille. So that really beautiful video talks about some of the challenges on the Navajo Nation in regards to water availability and the really importance to water and why it's so vital uh, in this region. And that video was created um, with our intern on this project um, and really stressed the importance of connecting to community through language and the use of the Diné language 
um, to introduce this work and to introduce the importance of this work. And um, this project or the Navajo Nation Drought Severity Evaluation Tool was a project for NASA WAO um, from about 2017 to 2020. And it actually got started as a collaborative internship project with our DEVELOP program, which is also within the capacity building program. The Navajo Nation, um, as you heard, faces many water challenges. It is the largest federally recognized sovereign tribe in the United States in total land area of over 70,000 square kilometers and a population of around 200,000. It's located in the Four Corners region of the southwestern U.S. in the states of Arizona, New Mexico, and Utah. And um, because drought is so common, um, water is really vital. And there is limited ground-based climate information um, in this region. And there is low reliability um, on the water supply. And so we really focused on a lot of these needs and we collaborated with the Navajo Nation Department of Water Resources and the Desert Institute to include things like the Navajo rain gauge data, satellite data, and modeled and gridded data through our tool. And I'll give you a little demonstration of the tool as well. So the primary objective of this project was really to create a user-friendly, freely accessible tool to assess the impact of drought across the Navajo Nation. And we designed this tool to be free and open and user-friendly through the Climate Engine um, web tool. And so DSET is actually a spin-off of Climate Engine. And when I start with the demo, I'll, I'll jump right into Climate Engine because the beauty of Climate Engine is that many of these data and analysis aspects of the DSET tool, which I'll highlight, are globally available in the Climate Engine um, platform as well. So to speak a little more specifically about our tool, one really important piece was the inclusion of the Navajo Nation rain gauge data. And there are 85 rain cans across this large, large region that are monitored in person on a quasi monthly basis to estimate um, total precipitation across the nation. And it was really important to include um, this information. And the other really important piece that you can see is the inclusion of the Navajo Nation administrative boundaries. What you're seeing now are the five agencies, which are akin to US states. And um, what you will see later on are the 110 chapters, um, which are sort of similar to US counties um, available on the Navajo Nation. What you can do with this tool is you can um, calculate and visualize gridded maps using the raster information. And we've also included the option to do area average polygons. And this was a really big lift and an important part of our project. So what you're seeing here now are the 110 chapters and you're seeing the most important um, drought metric for the Navajo Nation, the 180 day or six month SPI. And this is the drought metric that they use to trigger drought emergencies. Whenever this value goes below negative 1.5, anywhere on the Navajo Nation, a drought declaration can be um, called. DSET also allows users to generate time series or figures of one to two variables. So what you're seeing here now is the precipitation um, from GPM alongside the six month SPI um, from GridMet, which you see in green and the, the precipitation you see in blue for a very specific chapter called Bird Springs on the Navajo Nation. And you can do all of this in the tool on the fly. And as I mentioned, um, this is really important for drought declarations. Um, this is a great example of where one portion of the nation might be within that exceptional drought category um, and it's really clearly identified um, here. And so a doubt, drought declaration could be made using this information and um, some resources and mitigation activities could um, occur. For this project, we really cared so much about having and ensuring that it was partner driven. And so we had um, two different kind of training activities. And the first was 
about halfway through the project to do some beta testing and to get feedback on what we should include, what not to include um, within the tool, what's really useful for decision making. Um, we also have this online user guide that was made available um, for folks to um, take a look at and do some um, calculations and demonstrations on their own. So now I will jump into a really brief um, demonstration of Climate Engine and the DSET tool. So I'd like to start this demo by um, first navigating here to the Climate Engine uh, main page. And uh, as I mentioned, I really wanna point out that most of these data layers and analyses that I will highlight through DSET are also available globally through the Climate Engine website shown here. So all you need to do is, um, in order to launch this application, is to have a, um, an account. So it just requires a Google account, and you can come right here to climateengine.org and launch the application. And if, if you're logged in, like I am, you'll start to see um, the interface here. And they have some really beautiful guided and video tours available. So I really encourage you to take a look at that if you're interested in some of these things that I'll be highlighting with DSET. So for this regional example, I just wanna to navigate to NASA's Western Water Applications Office. And um, again, this is our main um, website for the program that I spoke about earlier. And within our water portfolio, you can see we have a link to the Navajo Drought Tool User Guide. And this is the beautiful user guide that I mentioned um, where we have uh, the place to visit the tool. But I also wanted to highlight we have introduc the introductory video, a longer version than what you saw today. And we have um, videos and um, hands-on guided exercises for assessing drought, performing crop analyses, looking at the status of lakes and meadows, and gauging the state of snowpack. So you can come here and take a look at all of this information as well. I will just come back up here and go to our drought tool directly. And you can see here that it looks very similar to the main page for Climate Engine. So you have along the left-hand side here the ability to um, change some of the variables for the map layer and then also make a graph. So we'll just do a, a couple of really quick um, analyses here. Um, you'll notice that we have the um, Navajo Nation and the chapter boundaries centered um, on the map. One thing that I'll just do here is change the base map so we can um, see the data a little more clearly to roadmap. So you can, again, change all of these similar features here or in Climate Engine as you'd like. Now we can see the outline of the um, chapter boundaries. I also want to mention that we have available the U.S. Tribal Nations boundaries as well. So you can turn this layer on and you can see all of the other um, federally recognized tribal boundaries and do um, any kind of analyses and map making over similar regions as well. I am just going to go back to our chapters layer that we have here and do some analyses. Now, as mentioned, the most important variable for the Navajo Nation Drought Emergency Management is the six month SPI or Standardized Precipitation Index. And I wanna start by adding that layer for a particularly interesting time period in water rights management for the Navajo Nation. On June 22nd, 2023, the Supreme Court ruled against the Navajo Nation over claims that the federal government had failed to assert the tribe's need for water access in the arid West. There's a long and complex history of treaties, agreements, and court decisions that over decades have dictated how the waters of the Colorado River are allocated. And this situation is compounded by a changing climate and scarce water supplies. So I wanna start out by taking a look at the GridMet drought four kilometer um, six month SPI as of the June 22nd, 2023 start date. If you come over here and take a look at the variables, you'll see that that is the default. And the only thing I need to do is, here is change the time period to June 22nd. 2023. So we have 2023 0622 and I can click on get map layer. 
You'll notice here that it set the um, set it to the closest valid date where they've computed the six months prior to this date. So it's essentially the the average um, SPI over the six months prior to the, this June twenty second date, and in this case, June twenty fourth. So what you'll notice here is that it was a particularly wet period on the Navajo Nation with the SPIs corresponding to um, a drought scale that's moderately wet in some portions and extremely or exceptionally wet in other portions. And you can look at that by clicking right here on the question mark. So um, this was a fairly wet time period um, as dictated by the monsoon. Um, but now let's take a look at three months later in September of the same um, same year. So all I want to do here is change the state to um, September and then click on get map layer. So now you can see that most of the eastern half of the Navajo Nation is in exceptional drought, showing how quickly these conditions can change. You can also take a look at other variables um, here along the data sets. You can take a look at different types of um, data and models. And within GridMet, you can take a look at other kinds of drought indices as well. Um, you can also take a look at um, precipitation um, over this time period and do some calculation um, there as well. So for example, um, what we can do is we can take a look at the um, GridMet daily and take a look at the precipitation, which comes up as the default here. And if you look over the same time period, you can you can take a look at the percent of average precipitation. So what we can do here in the processing um, over this the total and the the statistic is we can look at the percent of average conditions. And we can look over the same time period where we were examining the um, SPI from March to September of 2023. So you can see here that the custom date range has defaulted to that six month time period. And we can take a look at the get map layer as well. So here you can also, now we're looking at the precipitation percent of average, and you can see that in many portions of the Eastern Navajo Nation, it's much um, less than average. You can also get a specific value by clicking on get value and moving it to anywhere here um, on the nation and clicking show value. And so you can see what uh, percent of average the precipitation was here. In this case, it's almost 35% of average for this state for the state range. Another difficult time period for the Navajo Nation and the world was during the COVID pandemic. And this year was particularly hard with lockdown and lack of rain to support crops and livestock. So if we take a look at May 2020, you um, can also see some variable conditions. Um, um, in, when considering the SPI. So let's just go back here to the GridMet drought, and we're gonna take a look at the 180, 180 day SPI, and we are gonna take a look at May of 2020. And click get map layer. Here you can see those variable conditions where it's slightly wetter in the southwest and slightly drier um, in the um, northeast. And again, if we look then towards September, for example, of the same year, we can see that this was a really exceptional drought in this region. And this was especially challenging due to the lack of potable water and lockdown constraints. And so these types of data alongside understanding the community challenges can help us understand the drought conditions. Um, I also wanna mention that there are many other 
um, variables available here. You can look at remote sensing data and you can look at Landsat, MODIS, um, Sentinel, and you can look at things like the vegetation index and many other data sets available. Um, and in particular on the Climate Engine website, there are even more data sets than we have available. So I just, um, the final thing I wanna highlight is the ability for Climate Engine and DSET to make graphs. So if you click on make graph here, and let's say we're interested in examining the precipitation versus the SPI in the White Rock chapter, um, uh, which is near Canyon de Chez. Um, so what we can do here is um, we can do a two variable analysis. Um, we could pick a chapter here um, and we can take a look at, um, for example, if we're interested in the Canyon de Chez region, we could take a look at the Chin Li chapter and you'll see we are directed towards this region in our map when we select that. We can take a look at the climate and hydrology and we can take a look at the precipitation versus the SPI. So if we take a look at the GridMet daily precipitation, we can, um, let's just use the 2020 water year as the example. So we can start off with October, 2019. To September. 2020. And then for variable two, we can look at the SPI over the same time period. So you can see here we have the grid met drought SPI, and we can just go ahead and copy and paste the same date range. And what we're going to do here is just make a simple graph looking at these two variables and how they might change over time. Now we click get time series. Great. So now what you can see is the precipitation in blue and the six month SPI in green for the Chin Li chapter. So that very specific chapter within the Navajo Nation. You can see how the SPI um, increases after many different um, rainfall events um, and then starts to slowly decrease after a pretty dry period um, and there is clearly a lagged uh, effect of the six month SPI um, versus the precipitation. I also want to mention you can download data as PNGs so you can download these kinds of um, graphs as, a, as an image or you can download the data here as well. Um, and that just highlights some of the features um, of DSET um, and the importance of these data um, during these really interesting time periods on the Navajo Nation. Um, so I do encourage you all to take a look at DSET, take a look at Climate Engine, um, if you're interested in doing these kinds of analyses. So uh, that concludes the demo for today. I wanna thank you again for having me and now I will um, pass the proceedings over to Erica. So over to you, Erica, thank you. Hello everyone, this is Erica Podest and I am an instructor with the RCEP program and a scientist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. The next demo will be focused on the use of a tool known as the Sustainable Forest Management Information System or SFMIS, uh, which generates land cover classifications. So in this case, we will generate land cover classifications during and after a drought to assess the impact on land cover. This tool was developed through a NASA ROSES ecological forecasting grant. This demonstration will be focused on how to run the SFMIS tool, which as mentioned is a land cover classification tool in order to assess vegetation cover change due to a drought. The demonstration will be over the country or part of the country of Panama, specifically for 2015, which was a strong El Nino year, which brings drought to the country. And these drought conditions were also pervasive uh, in the previous three years uh, where there was unusually low precipitation. 
We will then focus on the year 2020, which was a slider, slightly wetter than normal year. And we will generate land cover maps for these two years and compare them to assess the difference in land cover due to drought. The two figures show th that you see here show precipitation anomalies for 2015 and 2020, where blue are drier than normal conditions and re red are wetter than normal conditions. Note that Panama has uh, two distinctive seasons, the wet and the dry season. And in this example, we are working with satellite data from the wet season only. And we will also be focusing on the eastern portion, central to eastern portion of the country, where the impacts of the drought were the strongest. The tool runs on Jupyter Notebook. It is open source and runs on open source data. And so during the demo, we will walk you on how to set up the tool and how to run it. The demo will only use optical data from Landsat 8. However, the tool can also run with other optical data, such as Sentinel-2 or a combination of Landsat 8 and Sentinel-2, as well as with radar data, such as Sentinel-1 or Pulsar data. Uh, data sets that are, are available on the Google Earth Engine uh, database. The tool also uses ancillary data sets to help inform the classification, in this case, a digital elevation model. And the classification algorithm used is a supervised approach based on random forest. The training is from a land cover reference map that was generated by the Panamanian Ministry of the Environment. So the tool has different classification approaches. The first classification approach, which is the one that we will be showing in today's demo, is based on the median composite of all Landsat 8 images over our study area during the wet season, which spans from around um, May through early December. And the reason for focusing the classification on the wet season is because land cover can vary between the wet and the dry season. Uh, the second approach classifies each image within the Landsat 8 collection individually. And then the class assigned to each pixel, um, that the, the, whatever each pixel was assigned, the final class is the majority of the classes for that pixel. Um, so that's the final class that is assigned to each individual pixel. And then the third classification is focused on combining data from multiple sensors. And in this approach, say we're using optical data from Sentinel-2 and Landsat-8, then we can then classify Sentinel-2 and Landsat-8 image collections separately and combine their cl classified information. So basically, the class assigned to each pixel uh, was decided based on the majority vote for a class. And this approach uh, yielded the highest classification accuracy from all other approaches. And also, by construction, this approach is guaranteed to have the highest coverage. Let's get started with the demo. And you can access the notebook through the NASA RSET GitHub page. Done, and the link is on the slide here. I will now turn it over to Dr. Rita Majumder, who will show you how to set up and run the tool. Dr. Majumdar supported the development of this tool while he was a PhD student at the University of Maryland. He is currently a postdoctoral fellow at North Carolina State University, working on several problems pertaining to the statistical modeling of extreme weather and climate change. He was a member of the 2021-2022 Future of Fire cohort of the USGS Climate Adaptation Postdoctoral Fellows. He has a PhD in statistics from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, and specializes in spatial statistics, Bayesian inference, and probabilistic machine learning. Welcome, Dr. Majumdar. It's a pleasure to have you here. Um, again, uh, thanks for the introduction. I will be walking all of you through the demo of the SFMS tool for land cover classification. Uh, we're going to be using a few tools in this process. Uh, this is Zooms. You are logged into Google Colab, uh, into your Google Drive account. 
uh, as well as uh, you have an account on Google Earth Engine. There is some additional setup that we need to go through, but I will be walking you all through that. Okay, the first thing you need to do is uh, go into your Google Drive. This could be done through the web browser, like I have here, uh, or it could be done through your offline uh, Google Drive uh, software and create a folder inside there called GEE underscore exports. This is where uh, the output from the code you run will get exported. Uh, I'll briefly discuss later that it can be changed and the name, you can modify that. But for the time being, create this folder inside there uh, and uh, make it case sensitive. So the same case that you see in this case. So that's kind of step one. Um, the second thing is you will need to download the uh, Python notebook, which is run uh, as a Jupyter notebook uh, from the RSET page. And uh, you should have the exact link there. Uh, once you download it, you can download it on uh, you know, your local drives, but I will recommend downloading it within your Google Drive. It doesn't need to be specifically within this folder, but since we will be using a lot of Google resources throughout, uh, it's easier for the pipeline if the file itself is downloaded within your Google Drive. Okay, so now that both of those are kind of set up, we will be mostly working through two different websites. The first website is going to be Google Colab. I'm going to open that up really quick. The link to that is collab.research.google.com. Uh, this should already be set up like a Google Drive. You can see on the right hand side if you're logged into your account. I will recommend doing that because uh, you'll need access to run a bunch of the things. So once you open that, you have an option to just open up the, the Jupyter Notebook file that you've downloaded for this training. Um, it's technically possible to open it up directly from the GitHub. But for a couple of security reasons, I will not recommend that. Ideally, you want to go to the Google Drive tab and um, open up the file from there. If it's usually Google Drive is good at showing you Jupyter Notebook files that are already there on your Google Drive. If it doesn't, you can use the search function and search for it. Uh, in our case, the file we will be using is called Land Cover Classification Landsat 8. Click on that that will open up. Um, now, a couple of brief things to go through. The second thing we will need in terms of setup is for Google Earth Engine. Now, the website for Google Earth Engine, again, is code.earthengine.google.com. You should be able to see that you are signed in. You need to at least be signed in beforehand. Um, the second piece of the setup that needs to happen within Google Earth Engine is you need to set up uh, a project that all the code you will be running is associated with. This, this lets Google assign resources to that project. Um, and um, without this, you will not be able to run the code. You will see that I am already signed on to a project. It's this SFMS-347819. This number will also appear inside this uh, Jupyter Notebook file, uh, but that project name is unique to me. Uh, the others will run into permission issues if they try using that. So you should create your own project for doing that. I'm going to walk you through the steps of that right now. Uh, for some of you who might already have a project uh, created, and this is uh, not new information for you, you can just you know change cloud project and switch to an existing project. But I'm going to assume you don't have a project set up and just show you the process from scratch. And so, yeah, if you, if you create a uh, click on your uh, user avatar here, you'll see the option for register a new cloud project. This is going to be non-commercial, unpaid usage. The project type in my case is academia and research. This will hopefully apply to most of you. And then again, if you have an existing project that you want to link to, you can do that here. Otherwise, create a new Google project. Organization can be left blank. The project ID is going to be a unique identifier uh, that, that you just saw on the Google Colab page as well as the Google Earth Engine page. So, for example, let me call it something like SFMS-001. It needs numbers and letters. This is its text field, which is kind of like a description. Call it SFMS-test. 
and then continue to summary. Uh, this is happening because I had something else created like this. Let's try this once more. So it has to be a unique name. You can't have an existing project with that name. So I'm going to create a new one. Takes a couple of seconds to assign resources uh, and set it up. What I will, so, you know, the important piece is this. You should copy this or make a note of this. You can see this from your account later as well, but this is the unique identifier that you will need going forward. So do all of that, you click confirm. Again, it's gonna take a few seconds. It's gonna say it's registered. It's redirecting you to the code editor. Now the, the code editor, again, you saw it automatically redirects, redirects you back here. The new project should be opened up already. So you can see it's already assigned me to the new project I just created. So again, make a note of this. Uh, I am going to switch back to the my existing project because that is what it will draw resources from. This was for demo purposes. So you can always change cloud project. And then from the drop down list, it will show you the ones that exist. So this is the new one that I just created. This is the one that I've been using so far. I'm going to select that. Okay. So now that it is set up, we are ready to kind of start and um, start running the land cover classification code. So I'm going to close this for now, but we will open up this page again later on once we have started running a job. Okay. Now, this obviously is going to be empty for you for the time being. And therefore, let's go back to the collab page. Now, so the way Colab works is uh, you need to give it access or you will need to connect it to your Google Earth Engine account and project. Uh, you will also need to connect it to your Google Drive. Uh, the reason you connect it to your Google Drive is because the, like some of these uh, codes can generate you know, large files and uh, you don't want to have to manually babysit the whole process. You want this to be automated especially if you're running multiple pieces of code and you want them to be downloaded to your Google Drive uh, once it's done automatically. So this kind of facilitates that. It goes without saying that your Google Drive needs to have some empty space. Uh, none of the files we will be working with today are going to be massive. Probably, you know, a couple of hundred MBs, uh, megabytes is sufficient, but just have some space in your Google Drive so that the files can be exported there. A couple of packages will be installed when you, once you start. The moment you start running this uh, code, you will notice that Google has assigned you or Colab has assigned you RAM and disk. This is why we prefer running all of this on the cloud because it doesn't strain your system. Google's resources are usually good enough for running this sort of code. And so whenever you're connected, it'll, it'll show you that all of this is running. Okay, so every time each of these are called cells, every time a cell finishes running, you will see a tick mark beside it. That's uh, usually the sign. I'm going to hide the output from here. Now it's going to import a bunch of packages where one of the, them is the one we just installed. One of them already exists on Colab. And the third one is for some tabulation stuff. Okay, all of this is imported. The next two steps are the important ones. The first one is authenticate. This is, first of all, connecting Google Colab to your uh, Google Earth Engine account. So allow, then it's gonna bring up this sort of Google login screen, which several of you might have seen before. Um, if your email ID that you're not logged in uh, that you're logged into Google Earth Engine doesn't show up here. You need to log in and select that. But usually if you're logged into stuff, this will show up there. Click on that. Click on continue. Click on continue. Okay, tick mark. This has worked perfectly. So now your runtime is connected to Google Earth Engine. Next, you'll allow it to have resources, which will connect you to the um, the project you just created on uh, Google Colab, uh, sorry, on Google Earth Engine. So if you run the next line, that happens. Now, 
I'm going to zoom in here for a second. As you can see, this is this is the project that I have on Google Earth Engine SFMS dash three four seven eight one nine. So if I go back to the Earth Engine website, that's the project I'm using. You should just replace this with you know whatever project you just created. So for example, if your project is called SFMS zero zero three, you just replace it with that. Uh, if you don't, if you for example say link to something that doesn't exist or leave it blank. It will usually give you an error in my case, uh, probably because I'm already signed in. It's not showing that. Okay. I'm going to switch this back to what I had. We're going to stick with that. Okay. The last bit of setup that is required is, um, allowing Google Drive access to your account, which is what this does. You'll have a very similar setup like you just had with this EE authenticate function. So you say connect to Google Drive. Again, select the account. Uh, I think it's not necessary, but it is convenient if the Google Drive account, the Google Colab account, as well as the Google Earth Engine account are all you know, connected to the same Gmail ID. Not necessary, it can be across different IDs, but I think it's just simpler to keep track of. So you select that, give it permissions, continue. Okay, and that has successfully run. Uh, later on, when we are at the export stage of this file, I'll show you where this comes into play. Okay, now we're actually getting into running the actual analysis. There is going to be some importing data, some importing functions, some initial setup. Uh, part of it is, you know, preloaded, part of it the user can modify. Let's work through that. The first bit is a data import. A lot of these cells are going to be minimized by default, but you can go in and look uh, if you want. Uh, the couple of things I will bring your attention to are these three files. Uh, these are the land cover. Uh, reference map. So the ground truth for 2012 and 2019, uh, which is used to train our model. The 3C, you will see a 2C later on as well, stands for three classes. In this case, forest, non-forest, and pasture. This is our region of interest uh, by a polygon within the country of Panama. And uh, there are a bunch of other uh, files that are imported, as you can see from the parts they're imported from. They're all imported from uh, a Google Earth Engine account, in this case, mine. Um, and But they're all openly available, and those are the ones that are used to train the model. So I'm going to minimize this in a second, and I will run this. Okay, all data has been imported, so you can see the tick mark here. Uh, the next piece that needs to be done is uh, reprojecting some of the maps. Uh, so the Google Earth Engine, uh, which hosts the... Uh, Landsat 8 data set and the Sentinel data set, they are all in this uh, 4326 projection. The land cover maps that we have in the beginning are not. So I'm just going to reproject them. So they're all you know in the same projection and there are no misalignment issues. There are a bunch of functions. Um, most of them are standard. One of them is uh, supplied by Landsat 8. I'm not going to go into details, but when we use them, I'm going to tell you what each of them does. So these functions needs to be defined. Okay, now comes the interesting bit, which sets up the parameters of the model. Now, the two things that you will need to take into consideration when you run all of this is what year you want the land cover map for and what season you want the land cover map for. Um, the years, uh, I think the Landsat goes back earliest to roughly 2014-ish, and it should work easily until 2021. You'll see in a bit that will give a warning about um, a deprecated data set. I'm going to discuss that. Uh, but up till 2021, all of this that is set up should be fine. Um, as for the seasons, the seasons have been defined specifically for Panama, and I will not recommend changing these dates. Uh, there is an option to change them later on, uh, but you should stick with these because the some of the underlying setup have been defined based on these dates. So annual is just the entire year. Dry season is January to March. Wet season is May to December. Okay, so 
for example, if we want this to be 2015 and W is wet, uh, and then so it's going to be D, W, or uh, A for dry, wet, or annual. In this case, it's going to be the wet season, so I'm going to say W. No need to change any of these. These are fairly standard and have been tested, so just stick with all of that. Run this. Okay, so now we're going to do classification 2015. Um, this cell, again, uh, no need to modify anything here, but basically it uh, sets the export file name. And the reason I'm showing you here is um, I want to go through what the file names look like and kind of what they represent. So the first two letters represent the data set, so Landsat 8. The second two letters represent the what is classified. You will, you've seen probably in the PowerPoint that there are two types of methods we'll be using. We'll either be classifying a median composite or we will be classifying the entire image collection, which is this IC. So it's kind of uh, defining that, the year, followed by the analysis scale is the resolution. It is set to 20 meters by default, which is what a lot of the bands and information are. I'll not recommend changing this because uh, at least making it less than 20 meters because it requires a lot more processing power, a lot more time. And if you try to do it for large spots of the country, uh, you will run out of resources on Google Earth Engine. And finally, it adds the season at the end. So, you know, W or A or um, otherwise, I think it's just going to make it D. Okay, so this just generates the file name beforehand. So it's automated later on. This imports the Landsat data. So you can see it's importing uh, the image collection for Landsat. Uh, it's filtering it by the start date and end date. That depends on what season you chose. It's uh, chopping up by the shape of the entire country because that's what the model is trained on. This is a cloud mask that it's applied to each image. This is a water mask that is applied to each image. This is a band for the elevation info that is applied to each image. And finally, an NDVI calculation that is done based on the Landsat um, bands that is also applied to each image. Um, this also loads up the training data sets that we will be using, which is just you know a composite of the Landsat data for 2019, which is our reference year for the three seasons. And when you run this, you will get a warning that this data set has, is a deprecated asset. So uh, once Landsat 9 came out, uh, they deprecated a bunch of these things. Uh, if you go to this link when you run it, you can see the discussion on that. But uh, the current, this data set that we are using is still completely okay until uh, anything up until 2021. Beyond that, uh, they have a discussion on this web page, which will tell you to just change the name of the data set. So all you need to do is basically change this data set to whatever they recommend here, depending on the year. But uh, for the purposes of this training, we are good. Uh, I will not rerun this cell, but this essentially just tells you how many images are in that image collection. So for like, uh, I don't think this is uh, 126, it was for 2015, it's probably for 2020. Uh, the reason I'm not running it is takes a bit of time. It's going to be a very similar number when you run this. And it's kind of like a sanity check to make sure the data has been imported properly. Some more setup before we run the random forest. Going to prepare the data for classification, which will create a median composite. So it takes the collection, calculates its median. It uh, creates the three classes that we're going to be using, forest, non-forest, and pasture. It selects the bands of interest. These are the optical bands. Elevation and slope come from that DEM function, which is the SRTM data set. And uh, NDVI is calculated based on the Landsat bands itself. Um, and finally, the data import up top, uh, if you look at it later on, you'll see it's got like some 70 or 80 training polygons uh, across the three different classes. This just imports those. I'm gonna minimize and run that. Okay. This says do not run in all caps because this is essentially going to try and download this uh, entire composite with all of these bands. The reason it says do not run is I think the resulting file is a few gigabytes in size. Um, you can do it if you want to, but it's not going to serve any important purpose. Okay, now we are actually getting to 
uh, the meat and potatoes, which is the actual classification. This is the random forest classification on the median composite that we just created in the previous cell. So the, we first define a classifier, which is a random forest. The random forest has a bunch of parameters. All of these parameters were set up top in the same cell where we set the, the year and the season. So no need to change any of this. You tell uh, the random forest that it's gonna train on the training features, which is the forest, non-forest and pasture that we had. And uh, it will train using the bands that we just defined previously. When Once the classifier is defined, you're gonna take the annual composite or the seasonal composite in this case, select the bands of interest, classify using the classifier, and we rename the layer for uh, ease of use later on. Okay, uh, one thing you'll notice, like this is supposed to have taken longer, uh, but it didn't, it just said it's done immediately. Uh, that's because uh, a lot of these um, software have, I think the technical term for this is a lazy implementation, which kind of queues up these things, but don't actually run the classification until you try to export the output. Um, that's why these cells are running fast, but the moment I try to export this, you will see that the actual underlying work has begun. Okay, before I try to export this, a uh, couple of housekeeping things. We eventually care about forest and non-forest, but as you saw up top, I mentioned there was forest, non-forest, and pasture. The classified 2C, which is two classes, takes the classified, uh, which had three classes, and runs it through this function, aptly named pasture to non-forest. So it essentially collapses the pasture class back into non-forest, so you're left with two classes. So it's gonna do that. And this is the export statement. Couple of things to note here. Um, it's gonna export it for that ROI uh, that we had. Just a second, my mouse. Yeah, mouse was being finicky. ROI, which was that polygon. Um, this is the file name. As I showed up top, the file names are automatically generated. And as you will see, uh, that's why you don't have to manually input them here. This is the folder name. This is the folder that I asked uh, all of you to create right in the beginning of the training. Now, if you want to um, mess around with it, you can change the folder name here, in which case you will need to change the folder name here. But uh, the Colab will look for this folder name inside your Google Drive because you've given it access to your Google Drive when you try to export this. Uh, and just a couple of other housekeeping things is I think this piece, it's gonna have this unmask statement in there. And when we open up the output file, you'll see what it does. Because a lot of, because you saw in the beginning, we applied a water mask, we applied um, a mask for the uh, clouds as well. We kind of want to unmask them later on. So you have access to the entire data. And so this is required before the export is run. Um, so I'm going to run this export. And so this one shows the status that, you know, it's starting, it's running. And uh, you can actually track this in more detail on the Colab page, uh, sorry, on the Google Earth Engine page. Before I go there, you can always also track this from here. So whenever you run this, it'll show that it's been running for these many seconds. Obviously, this is machine time, so it's not really readable, um, but like how many attempts, uh, priority, the name of the export file uh, and the state, whether it's running or completed. Now, how do you actively track this? So yeah, once you run the export, if you go back to the code earthenginegoogle.com page, it might take a few seconds to populate, but you will see under tasks, the current tasks that are running. Uh, I accidentally have a duplicate running. I'm gonna cancel one of those, um, but so multiple tasks will run and you can track them in more detail if you go to the task manager. The task manager will actually show a bunch of your previous tasks as well. So like tasks I've run in the past, uh, I'm gonna cancel these two for the time being because they take, I would say in the ballpark of 20 minutes to run if you look at all of these previous tasks. So you can also individually cancel them or you can do bulk cancel mode which will cancel everything that's running. So if we accidentally start a task more than once. 
Okay, so these have now been canceled, uh, but that's fine. Otherwise, it's going to run for 20 minutes or so, and then it's going to show you this tick mark that uh, it has finished running successfully. Before I show you the output, I'm going to also show you how the classification works on the entire image collection. It's, it's very similar. It's two additional lines of code. But as you saw, these were the classifications on the median composite for 2015. If I go back to the Google Colab page, the next section is classifying on the image collection and interpreting it. Um, it's, it's all wrappers of functions that you just saw previously. So all the you know, prep work is already done. Running it now is just two extra lines where it takes this entire collection of images, that hundred and something uh, images, it runs it through, uh, sorry, this is the actual collection of images, the Landsat collection. It runs it through this function called RF collection, which does the whole series of things, which is selecting the right bands, selecting the forest, non-forest classes, running the classifier. And then also does this last step, which is taking the three classes version into the two classes version, which just is forest and non-forest. So all of done is kind of all of that is kind of done automatically through this. Uh, if you really care, this RF collection function is in that cell near the top, which had all the functions. If you really want to parse through it, so you want to run that. And uh, again, as you saw, this run automatically, but uh, you know nothing has started yet. Let me refresh this. The tasks. It's gonna sometimes takes a few seconds to populate. So nothing has started yet, even though I have run it. Uh, because as I mentioned, it none of the code starts running until you ask to either display the results or export the results. Um, there is some more housekeeping that happens here. Uh, because um, you saw in the PowerPoint that it talks about, you know, how to interpret if you have all the images that are classified, this kind of combines all that information together. Uh, and the export statement looks basically the same. The classification file name, again, is automatically set, and it, it takes the file and it just exports that. This will, by the way, take longer to export than the median composite. That's, I think, the main difference, because the median composite is only exporting one file. This has to do a lot more pre-processing in terms of classifying every single image before it exports it. So this takes longer. And then when you run that, we give this a few seconds. There we go. This is already populated here. If you again go to the task manager, which is this one, you will see that this is running. Uh, you can run multiple tasks at the same time, but uh, kind of Google prioritizes, like there is a priority thing. If you are running multiple, the first couple will be priority 100, then it'll be lower priority. Since the resources it allots you are finite, if you run too many, it's a small chance the later ones, you know, get it shows it's running, but it'll probably be pending uh, until the earlier ones are completed. So I will not recommend running more than maybe two to four tasks at the same time. Okay, I will cancel this one as well because it's gonna take a while. Uh, but luckily for you guys, I've already kind of generated all of these data beforehand, and I can show you what each of them look like and how you can interpret it. So once they finish running, I'm gonna pull up an example of something for me that has finished running. Uh, you can, you know, go here, and then you can click on open in drive, which will basically open up the same folder you saw at the beginning of this demo, the GE exports folder where everything gets saved. Right, it's the same identical folder. Now, uh, whichever file then you want to see the details of, you will need to download them, which is very standard for Google Drive. You just click on download. You see the file sizes are not very large. Uh, the image collection ones are slightly larger. Um, the, the median ones are slightly smaller, but each of them is gonna be fairly small. Download them locally. Uh, you can also directly open them from your Google Drive. That is also fine if your Google Drive is synced to your local hard drive. Um, but otherwise, just download them locally, and then you can open them up in any compatible software, which can read these TIFF files. The one that I usually use is the software called QGIS, uh, which makes uh, looking at all of this data fairly straightforward. So that's what I will uh, show you for the last bit. So, yeah, once you have a software like this opened up, these are the files that have been generated. Let me show them slightly large. 
Uh, can we make this even larger? Yes, we can. As you can see, the names are fairly self-explanatory. They're all going to be Landsat 8. Uh, they're all going to be classifications. Some are image collection, some are medians. Uh, the years are going to be 2015 or 2020 or anything in between if you change that. And then you will see the resolution, which is always going to be 20 meters and the season. In particular, let me show you this file and I will also show you the corresponding file from 2020. Right, we're going to take one of these files and let me make sure I'm grabbing the right one. Yeah, classification median and we're going to drag, drag it onto QGIS. Which will display it, but as you can see, the the band information is weird. We need to make some more uh, changes to the properties. So I'm going to double click this, which takes me to the layer properties of this file. Um, and then you see the minimum value is minus 9999, which I pointed out was what we unmask missing values to and the maximum is two. So there are actually four bands in here that we will now assign to different colors. So the render type is going to be single band pseudo color. The interpolation is going to be exact because there is no interpolation. There are exactly four values in here. We want to set this to be quantile um, because that's the easiest to set up and there are going to be four classes. Okay, so this stays as is, this stays as is. I'm going to rename these two. The value is the actual value of the class. The label you can set to whatever, but zero. I'm going to set this to one. For, you know, completeness, let me also change the labels. This is missing. Uh, zero is my non-forest. One is my forest. And two is actually water. I'll also obviously change the colors to match. So the missing data I'm gonna put in gray, the water I am gonna put in blue, uh, the non-forest I'm gonna keep in yellow and the forest I'm gonna turn green. Okay, all of that is done. Now, if I apply that, you have a usable map. So all of this is water. Um, whatever is gray is almost all missing data. There are a few exceptions. The the shapefile that we have for Panama has the lakes and for example if I zoom in like the Panama Canal area is also as kind of missing which is fine uh, that's correct for our intents and purposes um, but yeah it's either cloudy data or it's like uh, an internal water body an inland water body but otherwise everything that you see here green is forest yellow is non-forest Let's do that really quick for the corresponding 2022 data. So 2022 median wet season, drag and drop. I'm going to do this really quickly. So pseudo color, uh, exact, quantile, four classes. Uh, let me make this zero, one and two. I'm not gonna bother changing the names again. This is zero. And then two is water, one is forest, and apply. So if you want to see the differences between the two, there are obviously uh, more involved tools in the software, but visually you can kind of see how uh, 2020 has a lot more forest classification than 2015, even if you take into account all the missing data. Um, and yeah, that's basically the entire process. You can always track what you have exported here. You can always track job status from the Earth Engine file. Okay, so the one last thing I wanted to point out that uh, this is mostly just methodology for generating land cover. And it in, in practice, you would want to validate a lot of these results. Now, as you saw in the beginning of the Colab file, that all of this was done, um, the, the baseline year for us is 2019. So it's very easy for us, well, relatively easy for us to validate this for 2019 because we have this file here. And you can also write your own export statement, export this LC 2019 file and do you know analysis for 2019 and validate. But if you're doing it for a different region or a different time period, uh, validation would be done by getting access to the ground truth and then comparing against the ground truth and seeing what, are there any kind of biases 
um, are those biases, you know, particular to a season or do they appear in annual data as well? All of that is kind of critical. This kind of just, uh, the demo today just demonstrates how you would do the random forest classification if you had ground truth for a particular year as, uh, as, as well as access to Landsat or Sentinel data and all of that. Um, and uh, also, as I mentioned, the data set, this particular data set has only been tested up till like roughly 2021, uh, which is, you know, beyond that, uh, as you saw this thing, the, the data set is deprecated, so it might not perform as well uh, for years beyond that, but anywhere between say 2015 and 2021, you should be good. Um, then that was most of the steps of the demo, and I will now pass it on to Erica, who will give her closing comments. Thank you very much. That was a, a great demo. Uh, just to remind participants that the demo uh, is focused on the methodology to generate a land cover classification. You can play around with this demo and modify it to generate a land cover class over your area of interest. You would need to change the study area, um, the period of time of interest. And also you can, you need to update the labels. So that would be the training and validation um, labels. And as long as you have the right data to validate for the same year that you're generating your results, you can validate that. And at the end of this code, there is a step to validate your results. Um, and one thing, uh, to mention too is that you can increase the number of classes here we had three and then two classes but if you have multiple classes that you can uh, train on you can certainly increase that capability in the code as well so um, with that I will now hand it over to Amita Thank you very much, Amber, Erica, and Ritam for the excellent presentations and demonstrations. With that, we conclude this four-part training on droughts. And just to summarize, this four-part training focused on drought monitoring, prediction, and projection based on Earth system observations and models. In part one, we talked about Droughts occurring on different timescales, ranging from weekly to decades. We talked about drought classifications and various types of droughts, including meteorological droughts, which are indicated by precipitation deficit, agricultural droughts, indicated by soil moisture deficit, low vegetation and low crop yields, and hydrological droughts, indicated by low stream flow and reduced groundwater. NASA Earth observations provide near real time to more than 10 years of data and in some cases to more than 20 years of data for drought monitoring including precipitation, surface temperatures, vegetation cover, soil moisture and groundwater. In part 2, we talked about NASA sub-seasonal to seasonal prediction system that provides ensemble of forecasts of temperature, precipitation, and soil moisture on monthly to seasonal timescales, useful for water resources and drought management. Then, in part three, we talked about NASA Earth Exchange global daily downscaled projections for coupled model intercomparison project phase six or next GDDP CMIP six climate projections for the 21st century, which are available from multiple global climate models downscaled at daily quarter degree latitude longitude resolutions. We reviewed satellites and sensors for earth observations useful for deriving drought indicators for different types of droughts that include precipitation, temperature, normalized difference vegetation index, evapotranspiration, soil moisture and groundwater and the satellites and sensors they are listed here in this table. In part one, we introduced drought indices, including standardized precipitation index, SPI, Palmer Drought Severity Index, PDSI, normalized difference vegetation index, NDVI, 
and vegetation condition index VCI. We also saw NDVI and solar induced fluorescence applications for monitoring agricultural drought. In part 2, we had an overview of NASA global modeling and assimilation of its S2S prediction system. And in part 3, we had an overview of next GDDP CMIP 6 climate projections. Today, Amber presented NASA VAO drought projects including Western Land Data Assimilation System LDAS and Grace based drought indicators. She also talked about Navajo Nation Drought Severity Evaluation Tool or DSET. And then we heard from Erica and Ritam about Sustainable Forest Management Information System SFMIS tool. We had several demonstrations of drought monitoring tools and we also conducted calculations and analysis for drought assessment. In part one, we had demonstrations of drought.gov and US Drought Monitor, and today we had demonstrations of DSET and SFMIS tools. In part one, we calculated SPI and VCI using Google Earth Engine. In part two, S2S predictions of temperature and precipitation anomalies were analyzed using QGIS. And in part three, climate change projections of temperature and precipitation were examined till 2100 from next GDDP using Google Earth Engine. There is one homework for the training and it is posted today on the training web page. The answers for the homework must be submitted via Google Forms and the due date is 15th of August. Certificate of completion will be awarded to those who attended all four live webinars and who completes the homework assignment by the deadline. You will receive the certificate uh, via email approximately two months after completion of the training. Here's the contact information for today's speakers. This is our set website link and our set social media links. Here are our sister programs for capacity buildings, develop and surveyor, and links are given here. And we want to thank all our speakers today from our set and our guest speakers from NASA, Compton Tucker and Andrea Molod, from NOAA, Kelsey Satalino, Brad Pugh and Steve Ansari, Ember McCullum for NASA Ames, and Rita Majumdar from NC State University. Our special thanks to our set coordinators and editors, Natasha Johnson Griffin, Sarah Kutschel, Susan Monthy, Brock Blevins, Selvin Hudson Odoy, and Jonathan O'Brien. And thank you all very much for attending today's session. Uh, this concludes our webinar series. In four parts, we have covered a lot of information about many aspects of droughts. Uh, we'll uh, go to the question and answer session. So we'll start with question one. Is the GRACE data open or free access? And I think, uh, Amber, you have answered the question, so uh, you want to unmute and address that? Yeah, fantastic. Thank you, Amida, and thank you, everyone, for joining um, our session. Um, the short answer is yes. Um, all NASA data are freely available. There are a few different places where you can access um, the GRACE data and visualize the GRACE data, and I've linked a couple of those here in my answer. Um, there's this really nice um, GRACE follow-on data analysis tool that allows you to visualize the data as well. Um, and then in the project that we highlighted with the Western LDAS project, um, you can access the um, maps um, and analysis that we presented as part of that project um, at this link here um, that I provided as well. Um, so those are uh, for the US and also um, many of, of that is available globally as well. Thank you. Um, second question also is for you. Is the drought too limited to the USA only? No. So I presented essentially our spin-off of Climate Engine. 
So for those of you interested in doing these types of analyses and using the data on a global basis, I would go for Climate Engine. So the, the drought severity evaluation tool um, was really tailored to the specific needs um, and uh, of the Navajo Nation. And so we had very specific things like their um, administrative boundaries, their rain gauge data, um, and the ability to calculate some area average statistics over those specific regions. However, because this was built as a spinoff of Climate Engine, many of the same analyses, data, um, are available via Climate Engine. Um, so you might not be able to do a very specific thing like the area averaged um, six month SPI over this specific administrative region, but you can do nearly all and many of the same analyses that we did with, with DSET at a global scale. And in fact, Climate Engine has actually more data available on it than our DSET tool. And we, we did that purposefully as well, where we sort of scaled back all of the data sets available. So Climate Engine now also has some forecasted data um, and a lot of really interesting model data to use. So um, I would go ahead and access the tool via um, the Climate Engine website that I mentioned here. And the only thing that you need is a, essentially a Google account. Um, and, and Climate Engine is built off of the Google Earth Engine um, skeleton, basically. So you heard all of these um, really fascinating things you can do with the um, Earth Engine code. And, and that is essentially building off of the power of, of Earth Engine and pulling in data available globally. Thank you, great. Uh, question three is, are SPI values standardized across the globe or normalized locally in some way? Yeah, that's a great question. So the SPI essentially quantifies observed precipitation as a standardized departure from a probability distribution function that models the raw precipitation data. So what this is doing is it essentially is looking at the region of interest in this example, sort of the pixel of interest and looking back at, say, the climatological average of precipitation in that specific place over time and comparing whatever um, time frame you're interested in looking at to that average. And so if, for example, we were looking at the um, you know, six month SPI starting today, the uh, model would look at the previous six months of this year and compare those six months of this year to the long-term average of precipitation in this same place. And so that's actually a real benefit to the use of the SPI because it's, it's specific to the region of interest, but it is also an easily transferable index across many different climatological regimes. Um, and you can, you can look at SPI on a variety of different timescales too. So you can look at this month compared to the climatological average of every other August um, in history in this region, or you can look at it um, at a larger time window. There are, however, limitations to the SPI because the only thing it's including is precipitation. And we all know, and from this fantastic training, there are a lot of factors at play when thinking about drought. So um, just wanted to make note that other indices um, include things like evapotranspiration, which is a, an important component of drought as well. And I've linked um, a, a nice website that describes the SPI in a little more detail there as well. Thank you, Amber. And I also want to uh, remind everyone that we went through a description of SPI in part one, and our prerequisite drought webinar also has great detail about SPI. Uh, we used, uh, Sean McCartney demonstrated a Google Earth Engine code, how to calculate SPI, and that's one of your homework questions based on that uh, exercise. So hopefully you learn more about SPI when you work with it. Thank you. Uh, question four, is the DSAT tool available for any country in the world, any other country? Yeah, so that's the same answer to question number two. DSET was tailored specifically to the Navajo Nation. However, um, 
all of the data available with the exception of the Navajo rain gauge data um, and even additional data are available globally via climate engine. So if you're interested in that, take a look at the climate engine website. Thank you. Thanks. Question five, does GEE exports have to be loaded in Google Colab? I have done the GEE authentication, connected the uh, project CF MIS 347819 and authenticated Google Drive. But for the data import, I have an error. EEE -E exception, Earth Engine client library not initialized. Run EEE -E -E initialized. So is there a step that I missed? I, mean, I, can, I can take that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm assuming this problem eventually got resolved because I did see follow up questions from the same poster. But yeah, it's, it's easy to miss that E dot initialize step because it's a single line. Uh, and that's the easiest way to check whether you're doing things in sequence, because if you don't run this, everything afterwards uh, will basically throw an error. Mm. Okay. Question six, is it possible to import the GEE map and view the results directly in Google Colab? Yeah, so thanks for pointing that out. Um, there are previous versions of this where we did have a GEE map in there uh, to kind of display results uh, within um, the interface, the Jupyter Notebook itself, but I've recently taken that out because depending on the size of the raster and the number of layers you want to display on it, the it can be a little finicky depending on what browser you're using. Um, but it, it's a fantastic package and it's got a lot of resources. Uh, so for those of you who are not familiar, I'd recommend looking up the package. I If I remember right, it's just GEE map, uh, single word, uh, all small letters, um, which will allow you to display a lot of these rasters directly inside the Jupyter Notebook. Thank you. The main question seven is for you also. Can you briefly discuss connection to Colab? Yeah, uh, if anybody has had like other specific issues, feel free to put it in a question so I can resolve them in like uh, any individual issues you might have. But generally it's fairly straightforward. It, it's similar to, you know, logging into any Google service. You just go to the web page that's listed there. If you're already signed into your Google account, it should show up on the top right that you're signed in like you have with Google Docs or Google Drive. If you're not, you'll see a sign in button uh, and you sign in with that and you should immediately be logged into Google Colab and you'll see just like the pop-up page I had in the beginning, which was asking me to load up the notebooks, that that should immediately be there next time you're at the web page. Great, question eight. When I select uh, tasks in GEE and run uh, L8CIS ME, um, 2019-20A3C, it shows image collection load. Um, this T1SR is deprecated. See the website um, for how the how to migrate to collection tool and set. Yeah, again, thank you for bringing this up. So between the time the demo was recorded and uh, essentially last week, the, the data set that was just deprecated before and through a warning, like you saw in the video, has since been deleted from Google Earth Engine altogether and it's forced the migration to the new version of the data set, which is CO2 slash T1 underscore L2. Uh, and so the Jupyter Notebook that you will end up downloading from the RSET webpage is actually updated. So it isn't uh, what was in the demo. It's updated to the new data set now. Uh, so A, it shouldn't show that deprecated warning. It should run without any issues. But you will also notice a couple of small changes uh, that I should point out. Uh, the largest one being that, uh, if you remember, there was a section which showed there was a three training, pre-trained uh, training rosters that were already there for the, the two seasons and the annual one. Those lines you will see are now commented out with a note that it's because the data set is deprecated and the current version of the code directly generates and trains on the training data while you're running uh, the notebook. Question nine, how many samples are needed for each class? Maybe use Sentinel images. Are there options we could include in our data? 
Yeah, this is a great question. And this is actually two different questions. So let me address them one by one. Yes, you can include Sentinel-2. Uh, if you look up Google Earth Engine's data set, you will see Sentinel-2 is available. I will recommend using the surface reflectance one, uh, which is, uh, I think, like underscore SR, which uh, generally has provided better classification performance in our tests. Um, and it's also at a slightly higher resolution. But the the downside of Sentinel-2, at least the surface reflectance data set, it doesn't go back as far as Landsat 8 does. Uh, and so because we wanted to show droughts and we wanted to go back as far as 2015, using that was not an option uh, in this demo, and that's why we resorted to Landsat 8. As far as um, the number of samples are in each class are concerned, there are a couple of ways to go about this. The, the short answer to your question is that um, it, it probably much fewer than we are using. So the way we selected the samples was by manually drawing polygons in the Google Earth Engine's uh, JavaScript interface, that code.earthengine .earth uh, platform. Uh, but you can also, there are ways to randomly sample locations. And so in our case, because we were drawing polygons, we have, I think, something on the order of 10 raised to 6 training points across the three classes. Um, but if I were to hazard a guess, I think you can probably get away with much less, something around, uh, you know, 10,000, so 10 raised to five, that order might actually be sufficient spread out across the three classes. Okay, question 10 is on the Navajo Nation case study, precipitation graph superimposed on SPI graph. How can you explain the lag on the SPI with respect to the precipitation? This lag was mentioned during the lecture. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, so what was shown here was the, the six month SPI. Um, and I'm sure Amita, you all covered um, sort of differences in time scale when assessing droughts and what that means for the SPI calculation. Um, so because the calculation is including essentially the last six months of data um, to create this one value at that new data point of the standardized precipitation index, there will in turn be a lag in these um, high precipitation events until you're um, seeing um, the SPI value change as a whole when looking at it over that sort of mid range time scale, like the six months. If you were, for example, to take a look at the one month SPI, you might see that SPI responding a little more quickly um, following one of these large sort of rainfall events. Um, so the that also uh, sort of highlights the benefit and maybe you know pitfalls in some way of using the SPI so you can look at the different time scales of this index to evaluate um, changes to different parts of the the water cycle and the water system so um, you know the soil moisture and the precipitation is going to change on a shorter scale but things like groundwater, stream flow, reservoir storage, those are gonna be changing on a longer term scale and may necessitate that longer term analysis. And um, Amita and team, feel free to add to that uh, response as you are the experts there as well, thanks. No, I think you, your answer is right on. So, uh, yeah, because we're, we're just looking at, at precipitation here with respect to long-term mean and so that lag, depending on what time window you choose, will be there because of these vectors that reach. The question 11, if in my study area I have specific and historical precipitation data from meteorological stations, how do you recommend integrating them into a drought analysis? So, Amber, you can um, respond to this, but uh, you can uh, calculate based on meteorological station, SPI can be calculated based on precipitation data. Um, and that would, of course, be limited to, to station data. If you can uh, interpol, if you have high density meteorological station, then you can maybe make a special interpolation and make a map from that of precipitation. Um, you, you perhaps can have a map of SPI, but otherwise at each station, you can calculate SPI. Just like yeah, you do. Yeah, go ahead. 
Yeah, I was just going to say that that's spot on. I mean, you could calculate it at a specific station. You could use a network of stations like a mesonet network or a variety of um, simultaneously gauged um, stations to create this like interpolated map. Exactly what you're saying, Amita, of um, pre of the SPI index and um, create that sort of gridded view. And so. Um, you can use the model data like this. You could use your own ground based information and it really is a matter of um, you know, what you find valuable, what's useful, what kind of scales you're interested in analyzing the, the SPI at um, and a lot of these um, drought indices do take into consideration ground based information when um, creating these maps. Great, thank you. We still have a few more minutes. If you have any questions, please enter them in the question and answer box. Just a reminder that homework is posted on the training website today. You can download it there and uh, you will have to answer questions in Google Forms. Also note that there are two questions based on GEE exercises. Uh, for part one, we had SPI calculations and VCI calculations. In part three, we had climate projections. So um, you will have to go through uh, those exercises. The code link is provided to you. Uh, so you will run those uh, GEE codes and then you will use that to answer a couple of questions in your homework assignment. Also, you will be receiving a survey from RSAT um, so please take a few moments to answer the survey questions. It provides us feedback about the training, um, you know, how we can improve, what you think you want to learn more about, or future topics of training. So please take a few moments to take the survey questions and that provides us great feedback. We value it a lot. So there's one more question. Does the grace follow on data also can be used to monitor deep, deep groundwater depletions in addition to shallow storage for hydrological drought? So I, I think we a specific answer will have to get back to you on that because um, what you see uh, in, in grace follow on gives like total groundwater, you know. It grace provides terrestrial total total water in a column, and then when you remove surface water, say from soil moisture, then what you get is the total groundwater. So what you are looking at is total groundwater variation. And Ember, please go ahead and add any additional information you have about that. Yeah, Amita, you're probably just as much as an expert on grace as I am. Um, but but that that's exactly right. I mean, the, the grace data are essentially a translation of gravitational anomalies from mm -hmm. specific regions, and that translates into total water storage. And so it doesn't necessarily parse out shallow versus deep groundwater. And I think in order to do something to that level, you would need some kind of like physically based model or some kind of characterization of the, the subsurface, um, which can be quite complex. Um, so it, it, yeah, there's not that sort of uh, underground resolution of where the water is. It's just a measure of um, if there's less or more water in this place, over time and you can um, pull out the different components, say surface water versus groundwater, but that's about as granular as you can get it, get at it without additional information about um, the lithology or the, the aquifer system itself. As far as I understand it. Yes. So when we post the, the question and answer uh, document, we will provide you a couple of references because Groundwater data, grace data have been assimilated into GLDAS, uh, Global Land Data Assimilation Model. So there you have variation in, I believe, shallow groundwater. Um, you can see that and soil moisture separately, but I uh, will provide you references for that. Okay. 
Question 13 is how do I select a suitable ML model for prediction if I use different Landsat data, I, I, I like different country, do I have to modify the parameters? Uh, yeah, I can take that. Hey, uh, that's actually a pretty good question. There are three parts to the answer. Uh, one, you will need ground truth data for whatever country you're working on, because to train, you need knowledge of what the ground truth is. Uh, in our demo, that was that LC 2019 data, which we got. The ground truth data could be something that exists on Google Earth Engine to begin with, or a raster that you get from a different source and you then upload to Google Earth Engine. Uh, second, you will probably want to play around with the optical bands. Uh, and there are some bands we've left out for specific seasons. If you go in and check, uh, you might want to see what works for different countries it will depend on, you know, where the country is located and uh, what the, how well uh, it performs there. The third thing is you want to validate your results for the year uh, for which you have the ground truth before you generate this for other years. There is uh, some additional code you will notice in the Jupyter Notebook at the end for validation uh, that you can use for the year that it's trained on. Uh, but specifically, you want to, especially if you're using the image collection approach, the, you will see there's a cutoff variable in there. Uh, you might want to uh, tweak that cutoff variable until you have a good balance of sensitivity and specificity and the validation is showing good accuracy. This is a good place, uh, Rita and Erika, to, to emphasize or talk more about ground truth or the training data that you use if you want to use this tool for any other region than Panama, right? This was trained on Panama. Yeah, this the thing that you see, uh, you know, the model itself was trained on Panama. And, and to go back to the question, you can still use random forests. Uh, I think that's a very mm -hmm. tractable, flexible model that can be used. But the quality of the land cover map you generate is going to be directly proportional to the quality of the ground truth information that you have. So if it's, for example, another derived product uh, of a, you know, a global land cover map, which has good performance generally, but might not be, you know, equally high accuracy in specific parts of the world. Uh, or it could be something very hyper local that you get and then you upload to Google Earth Engine and you use. But you will need a, a land cover map like that. And then you will need to define your own uh, classes in there, like point out this is forest, this is non forest before you do the training. Thank you. Uh, question 14 again. So for uh, grace fall on the groundwater storage content changes are most easily assessed in arid areas. Um, so, so grace follow on will give you total terrestrial water. Um, and so what you're saying is that, okay, if there's not much uh, soil moisture or uh, other, you know, column water there, and it's mostly groundwater, uh, then whatever changes you see are because of uh, groundwater. So I think that's correct. But when you see, um, you get total terrestrial water, uh, data and also you get groundwater data in which surface uh, water is subtracted. So both data sets I believe are available. So, but I think you are correct in principle, that's true because most variations are in groundwater in arid region, uh, less in, in, there is less soil moisture, less snow, so. If there's any additional comment from you, Erica and Amber, read them for any of the questions, please feel free to add. Yeah, thank you, Amita. Uh, this is Erica. I just wanted to add, um, in terms of the land cover classification you know, and adapting this to a different area, I think, uh, as Rita mentioned, the uh, the most important thing is to have good labels, so good, good um, reference data to train. Um, but it's also important to take a look at your results. And 
understand what might be some of the sources of uncertainty. So your classification in general for a whole country might yield good results, but then if you focus in specific areas that perhaps there is greater land um, uh, land cover heterogeneity, your um, results might not be as good. And so there you can then think about how to device or change your method for that specific area where you might be, uh, be uh, that might yield higher accuracy results. So there's a lot to think about when you do a classification um, because a, a lot of times, you know, the general land cover classification can be overall pretty good, but in certain areas it doesn't perform that well. And it's important to understand what are those sources of uncertainty and how you could potentially address them. Great, thanks, Erica. If, if there are no more questions, we want to thank you all for attending this Trout webinar series. And we hope to see you at future RSAT training. You can look at RSAT website and join the listserv. Um, also, all the training material and recordings of the code link, everything is available on the training webpage, so you can go back and revisit. There was one more question. Is it possible that from SPI we can define or identify a specific drought year if we do SPI time series? I think yes. I mean, it, uh, SPI uh, up to nine months, you can um, ideally from one to nine months, you we have looked at SPIs. And so you, if you do that, for multiple time scale, you should be able to say which is a drought year. Correct, Amber? I agree. I mean, and just the acknowledgement that it'll be drought based on solely precipitation. Yes. So, you know, there's there's so many factors to drought. Um, temperature anomalies, wind patterns, um, you know, there's a lot of other variables at play. Um, but yeah, I think it's a it's a great starting point in my mind for identifying mm -hmm. drought because it's simply just a comparison of you know previous conditions for similar time frames. Right, and so it's it's mostly you're talking about meteorological drought in the sense that precipitation mm -hmm. deficit you can see over one year, but then there are other processes which result from that, and then you. Uh, so temperature, evapotranspiration, soil moisture, groundwater, all that will be changing as a result of short-term precipitation changes. And that you cannot say anything about from SPI, but you can uh, definitely talk about precipitation deficit over, over the period that you analyze. So on behalf of the entire RSET team and all our guest speakers, thank you so much for attending this webinar series. And we hope to see you in future. Also, um, your homework will be due by 15th of August. All the material is available from the training webpage. And just a final reminder to, um, to answer the survey questions um, when you can, as soon as you receive the email, uh, you will get survey link and we look forward to your feedback.